Our previous speakers were introduced by non-directed kidney donors who serve on the advisory board of the National Kidney Donation Organization. And you won't be surprised, Ned, but our next speaker is also introduced by a member of the NKDO team. But Jen Benson is a little different from the others you've already met. Her perspective is that of someone who is a kidney and pancreas transplant recipient. I'm pleased to announce Dr. David Soror joining us today, formerly from Weill Cornell, New York Presbyterian, now with Hackensack Meridian Health. He is a phenomenal nephrologist with over 20 plus years of experience. He's excellent, fully devoted to his patients. His experience speaks volumes of his expertise. He is absolutely committed to his patients and his staff. Please welcome Dr. David Soror. I'd like to talk about chronic kidney disease as it pertains to people uh, with, uh, who are on dialysis or who are looking to eventually get a kidney transplant. So let's go through some uh, interesting illustrative slides. Uh, chronic kidney disease uh, are patients that um, uh, have a wide gamut of presentations. Uh, they can uh, have a 50% kidney function, they can have a 0% kidney function. By and large, patients that require a kidney transplant or require dialysis have stage four or stage five kidney disease. As you can see in the slides here, uh, the uh, higher the stage, the worse it is. And different things cause kidney disease in the United States. Most of them are diabetes and hypertension. There are other diseases as well, like polycystic kidney disease. Uh, but it would uh, be fantastic if we were able to prevent diabetes, prevent high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, and smoking. By doing those, you can probably prevent 70% of all diseases that we know in the United States. So that's a goal, prevention of CKD. Uh, it's been shown that CKD education clinics are very effective uh, in getting patients into treatment. Such clinics exist in the United States. Uh, they result in people not having to crash into the ER with end-stage renal disease, uh, but they are, um, they are educated early, they are referred to transplant early, they are referred to nephrologists and to fistulas creation early. And um, the prevalence of ESRD is growing. Uh, the number of patients on dialysis is growing probably because uh, there's a lot of diabetes, there's a lot of obesity, there's a lot of hypertension, but also patients are living longer. There's good primary care uh, in the country, and patients live longer than they ever did, and it's more time for damage to occur to their kidneys. And the treatment in terms of uh, dialysis and uh, different modalities of dialysis is also, of course, growing. Uh, but the, uh, the number of transplants has not really grown. The number of home hemodialysis is going up. The number of peritoneal dialysis, which is also at home, is going up. Uh, but transplant has been a little bit flat over the years, but recently has been improving as well. So uh, when someone does have chronic kidney disease, they, uh, most of them usually go on dialysis first as the availability of transplant is not there for everyone. So a dialysis machine sort of looks like this, and the main part of the dialysis machine is not the big stand-up machine that you see, but that little filter on the upper left-hand corner. That's the artificial kidney. Uh, so blood comes from the patient, goes into the kidney, into the artificial kidney, and water goes in the opposite direction through that same cartridge, thereby cleaning the blood. And the clean blood then returns to the patient. This takes about three to four hours for each session, and about 120 liters of water are used uh, in this session. So a good water supply, a clean water supply is needed. There are other, the, the usual dialysis is one where you go three times a week, and uh, you stay in the dialysis unit, or you can even do it at home three times a week. And uh, as, as you can see in that method, the um, shifts in water and waste does go up and down like, like a jagged pyramid, as you can see in the uh, illustration. Nocturnal hemodialysis is one where you do it almost every night, if not every night, and it's done for many hours so that the shift bet uh, between Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and so on is much less, much less than what it is when you have the intermittent three-day-a-week dialysis. The, uh, so this is an advantage of nocturnal 
hemodialysis. And as you can see from the slide here, uh, hemodialysis can be done at home, in your backyard sometimes. Uh, I'm not sure where this uh, guy is, but he's uh, got it all figured out. He's probably sitting by the pool. He's got his dialysis machine right next to him, and he seems to be uh, doing well and uh, is a happy guy. Not everybody like this looks like this on dialysis. This is one of the exceptions, but doing it at home is a pretty good option. The other option for patients at home for, hemo for dialysis is peritoneal dialysis. And peritoneal dialysis is sort of like what you see in the illustration. Water goes into the belly. Water sits in the belly for several hours and then uh, is removed from the belly by that same yellow catheter that you see. The water that goes in is kind of clean without any impurities in it. And when it comes out, it has a lot of BUN and creatinine and potassium and other things that normal kidneys get rid of. And this is done several times a day by the patient. It can take 30 minutes uh, each time to do it, four times a day, or a patient can do it while they're sleeping. And as you can see here, the same apparatus is, is there except that a machine puts the water in and takes the water out. And this happens uh, several times overnight. The patient, sort of from the inside out, clean water again goes into the peritoneal cavity and then dirty water, quote unquote, uh, comes out. And the patient then gets up in the morning and goes, goes and um, does the usual things he does all day without having to think about the peritoneal dialysis. Of course, that's not the ideal, those are not the ideal treatments. There are better treatments, um, such as kidney transplant. And kidney transplant is the ideal treatment for somebody with CKD or somebody with end-stage renal disease, which is on dialysis, because the expected remaining lifetime of a transplant patient is much better than someone who stays on dialysis. As you can see in this uh, graph, uh, the upper blue section is the U.S. population in general. The the, the lower red section is the dialysis patient population. Then the green section is the transplant patient. And what you see is that, for instance, if you are 40 years old and you get on dialysis, uh, you have less than 10 years left to live, uh, statistically, some more, some less, based on this graph. If you are a transplant patient, however, there's about 25 years uh, left to live. So. Uh, transplantation is certainly a much better modality than dialysis, certainly in, in the lifetime, in the expected lifetime. Also, of course, the quality of the life is much better with a transplant than it is on dialysis. When uh, someone gets a transplant, a third kidney is placed into that body. Uh, the two other kidneys are diseased and they're usually not touched. They stay where they are, but a third one is placed in the lower abdomen as pictured here. And that's either from a deceased donor kidney or from a live kidney. About two-thirds of kidneys in the United States are deceased donor and about a third are from live donors. And the live donor can be a brother, a spouse, a parent, a child, a friend, a cousin, a complete stranger. Uh, the medications now are so good that a good match is no longer required. Transplantation began in 1954 uh, on a regular basis, and in those days you had to have an identical twin to have a successful kidney transplant, as you see in the black and white picture to your left. Uh, one twin uh, gave to the other, and um, the uh, twin that donated the kidney is seen again on the right <clears throat> 50 years later with the transplant surgeon who put the kidney in. So donating a kidney certainly does not uh, decrease your length of life, as you can tell from the two pictures, and uh, does not hamper uh, your life in a significant way. Uh, nowadays, it's the same process. There is a, just like the doctors in the background there, there's a urologist, a transplant surgeon, and a nephrologist involved in kidney transplantation. When we uh, um, evaluate living donors, those that want to donate a kidney to a loved one or to a friend. Uh, we do a full physical examination. We do a lot of testing, uh, different blood tests, chest x-ray, EKG, CAT scan, 24-hour urine collections. We want to make sure that we are, that the donor is a healthy individual with low risk for him or herself down the line in terms of kidney disease. We don't want any donors suffering from kidney disease 20 years after donation, and by and large, that does not happen. But the workup is complete. 
and uh, we want to make sure the donor uh, is screened appropriately for cancer, uh, cervical, breast, prostate, colon, and skin cancer to make sure that there's no malignancies that they have or that they might transmit to the recipient. And nowadays, the donation process is easier than it used to be. Uh, the surgery is laparoscopic in 99% uh, of all centers. As you can tell here, there are a few small incisions and one larger incision. Uh, and even beyond laparoscopic, there's single port laparoscopic, which you can see here leaves a very nice cosmetic result with one scar as opposed to several small scars. And this works uh, just as well in, um, uh, as, as, the, as the older version of the laparoscopic surgery. Um, how safe is it for a donor to donate a kidney? Will they die from donation in the hospital? The answer is no. The uh, donor mortality for the inpatient stay is 0.007% chance of death, which is very, very low. To compare it to some of the more <clears throat> popular operations, like an appendectomy, it's 0.2%, and a cholecystectomy is 0.4%. So this is 0.007%. Thankfully, it's a very small number, hardly ever happens, and Part of the reason is, even though it's major surgery, is because the donor is a healthy person. They're, they have been ruled out from major diseases, and their risk, fact, their risk for, for um, surgery is low. So that's why donor surgery is amongst the safest surgeries that there are. And beyond um, having a great low mortality, uh, there's also a relatively low complication rate, though it's not zero. Uh, according to this study uh, of hundreds of pa about a thousand patients, uh, three percent did have major complications from the surgery. Ninety-seven percent did not, but three percent did have complications. Some of those three percent required reoperations or ICU stay or something like that. Um, while, so while donor deaths is close to zero, uh, donor complications is about three percent. Looking more long-term at the kidney function of that person who donated a kidney, it's great. Uh, uh, this is a study looking at 25 years post-donation, and the GFR, the percent kidney function, and the level of protein in the urine is very good uh, uh, for 25 years hence. Uh, similarly, this study showed the same thing. This is a nine-year uh, follow-up showing that the GFR, the kidney function of the donors, is solid. Uh, after nine years, and of course, the other study was 25 years, uh, but still showed the same idea. And just a summary uh, slide of comparing donors to healthy non-donors, also looking at the uh, function of their kidneys, and um, as you can see, 10-year study, the uh, donors are doing very well. Uh, we are careful uh, that our donors don't have excessive hypertension. You might be able to donate if you have mild hypertension, one that is perhaps controlled with one medication or two medications sometimes, but um, the, the worse the high blood pressure, the more chronic kidney disease that can happen. So we're very careful about donors not donating if they have serious hypertension. Uh, also, if a donor is obese, we would prefer for that donor to lose weight and to stay uh, at a lower weight uh, after donation because donors do have a higher risk of chronic kidney disease uh, years down the line, so we're careful about that as well. And if a donor has had a history of kidney stones, we're also very careful about what kind of kidney stones and how often it happened and when it happened so that there will not be a recurrence of those stones. Stones can recur 40 to 50 percent of the time, so we want to make sure that our donor is low risk for that. Also, if there is a family history of diabetes, we want the donor to be aware of that and tell us about it. So for instance, uh, you have a one in seven chance of getting diabetes if one of your parents had it before the age of 50. One in 13 chance if one of your parents was diagnosed after the age of 50, and a one in two chance, 50%, if both your parents have diabetes. So this is something, family history is something that is very important in terms of donation. If a uh, female wants to donate a kidney, that's okay to do. Um, if she is planning to have more babies after donation, that's also okay, but she has to know that there is a, a risk in terms of gestational hypertension, which is high blood pressure, such as preeclampsia, 
after donation. It's higher, it's 11% versus 5%. Uh, the baby, however, uh, is not um, is the same and not any in any way negatively affected by the woman having one kidney. So the, the fetal part is fine, uh, but the mother may have more gestational hypertension after donating a kidney. In terms of the overall risk of end stage renal disease for donors, it's relatively low. If you look at this. Uh, this, um, this representation here, the donor end-stage renal disease lifetime risk is about 0.9%. I rounded off to about 1% when I talk to donors. If you are someone who will stay with the two kidneys and not donate and you're just as healthy as the donor, that is a lower risk, 0.14%. So there is a, 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 uh, there is a little bit of a price to pay for a donation. Uh, it is better to have two kidneys than one, but uh, if you look at the absolute numbers, the absolute risk, it's about 1% lifetime risk of end-stage renal disease and uh, lower than that if you do not donate. In comparison, the general population that is not screened as well as donors are screened, they're not as healthy, so that's a 3% or 3.2% lifetime risk of ESRD. So uh, within live kidney donation, sometimes a donor is not compatible uh, with their recipients, so we do kidney pair donation. And we do that for someone that has a blood test that is not compatible, blood type that is not compatible with a donor, such as ABO incompatibility. Uh, or if the cross match is positive between donor and recipient, that is the mixing of the blood between the two causes the recipient um, white cells to fight against, uh, the recipient blood to fight against the donor white cells, that's called the cross match positive. Or if a donor, uh, if a recipient wants a better matched, younger, larger kidney, they may want kidney pair donation. Kidney pair donation, uh, some people call it kidney swaps or kidney exchanges, where you sort of exchange a kidney between another donor recipient pair that don't match each other and do match your donor and recipient. So that's where kidney pair donation comes in, has been, and it's accounting for about 10 to 15 percent of all live donations in the United States. It sort of looks like this. It can start as a easy two-pair exchange in the purple there, or a three-pair exchange, as you can see, or more commonly, a larger exchange, a larger cluster of patients. As you see, a chain of donations and transplants on the right side, a, an altruistic, a good Samaritan donor gives, uh, donates a kidney to a recipient, and then that recipient's donor go ahead, goes ahead and donates to another recipient, and so on down the line, there's a whole trigger cascade effect of donations and transplantations to the point where there could be a lot of kidneys flying across the country as depicted in this graph here. Uh, it's safe, it's done, uh, and the kidneys work as soon as they land. Um, in addition to kidney pair donation, there's also simultaneous kidney pancreas transplantation. In kidney pancreas transplantation, both the kidney and the pancreas are placed in order to get the diabetic off dialysis. That's the ideal situation, usually in type 1 diabetics. Uh, in the, nine, in uh, the last uh, 5 to 10 years, there's been uh, great strides in genetic um, um, instrumentation, genetic implementation uh, to uh, to sort of make uh, the pig kidney appear more human-like. And uh, transgenic techniques are used and knockout techniques are used. I won't belabor the details of it uh, right now, but it's come to the point where a uh, kidney from a, uh, a pig can go into a uh, monkey and it can stay there for up to a year uh, with heavy immunosuppression. Um, and uh, that is certainly an advance from just years back when it only lasted for a week or a month at most, and now these Xeno transplants can last uh, a year and more. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we'll uh, have an opportunity to ask questions and hopefully to answer them.